Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. Well, my background. Uh, my family moved to Morrisville in 1961, graduated from People's Academy in Morrisville, attended what was then Johnson State College, and had my uh, working career. Um, uh, I was nursing home administrator at the Greensboro Nursing Home in your backyard here, uh, and I was a nursing home administrator for 17 years. I then entered the legislature in the early 90s and served two terms for High Park and Wolcott. I was shortly, uh, at that time, appointed Commissioner of Aging and Disabilities and would later become Commissioner of Children for Families. Um, and I also was Chairman of what was known as the Public Oversight Commission, overseeing hospital budgets. So I've acquired a lot of experiences. Um, in my total of 10 years as a legislator, I was recognized by seven different organizations for my outstanding legislative service. AARP, um, the Vermont Recovery Network, the Community of Vermont Elders, Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, Vermont Association of Mental Health, excuse me, and Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights. So I think I, I come with experience. I can hit the ground running. Uh, I very much enjoy doing work. Um, a, a work of a legislator is not just voting, it's helping constituents when they need help. During the uh, pandemic, sadly, our unemployment system was broken. I helped over 300 Vermonters access unemployment benefits. To me, running for this job is about giving to others. It's a great forum to do that.
Um, yeah, so my background is in agriculture. Um, I've been operating my own organic vegetable farm for 16 years. And prior to that, I worked on other organic vegetable farms. Um, I moved to Vermont from Colorado to apprentice on uh, an animal-powered organic vegetable farm. And um, I've been farming, like I said, for 22 years. And over the course of the 20 years I've been in Vermont, I've started to notice a lot of change in, changes in our weather patterns. And about 10 years ago became um, increasingly concerned about climate change and how it was going to impact our agricultural economy and um, farmers, not just here in Vermont, but around the world. Um, I have a degree in anthropology and um, my field research and thesis was on indigenous agriculture. So I lived and worked with um, a tribe in Latin America. And I just kept tabs with farmers in the region. And I know that farmers in Latin America and around the world are seeing the impacts um, and have been seeing them for a long time. And we are starting to notice it really here in Vermont now. Um, and you know, two years with these, this extreme flooding, um, I think has opened um, people's eyes. But I, uh, I started working with 350 Vermont um, as an organizer on climate justice issues. And um, so as a farmer, I ha I've always had an off-farm job. Um, I've worked for rural Vermont. I uh, worked at Hunger Mountain Co-op. Uh, I, and now I'm currently working for the White River Natural Resources Conservation District. I've always believed that what our homes might be worth have little to do with our ability to pay. We pay our property, our, our school financing with our incomes, but how much we pay is, has been determined by what our property is worth. I think we need to change that. We need to move away from property as a value or indicator of what we should pay to what our incomes are. I believe that will be much more fair. And while we may not be able to leave the uh, resources of property completely, I would greatly like to diminish that. The proper balance to me is finding what, what does an education system need to serve our kids, our youth, so that they can be successful. And like our hospitals, I'm not digressing, we, we have a system in place that sets hospital budgets. We need to do the same with our schools so that um, they, they are not just giving to the state the bill and then the state being forced to pass it on to taxpayers. I think if we have some type of a system that says, here's what we think this year is an appropriate rate of growth for education spending, that will go a long ways toward the sustainability that we don't have at this time and put us in better balance between what we have to pay and what is, need, what is needed. I've always been a supporter of education, been on the school board in the past, and um, want to do whatever I can to make sure I help kids succeed.
Yeah, we need to um, readdress how we fund our schools. Uh, basing the funding of our schools solely on property taxes is um, is problematic um, because there are a lot of people who are either like land poor, or house poor, who have a home that they might have inherited but um, have no income, or elderly folks who um, have paid off their home but and and have a fixed income but um, see their property taxes rising and um, even with assistance it's it's still difficult for people to meet that tax burden um, so looking at new ways to fund our schools um, looking at maybe taking um, the pension out of the school budget and putting it back into the general fund. Um, there's a lot of different things that, that could happen and that need to happen. Um, also looking at increasing income taxes on the wealthiest Vermonters. And um, we have, you know, talking about raising taxes is always, uh, I guess, uh, a political career a killer, but it's necessary to help our communities function. We need to have some sort of revenue. And, um, you know, looking at income taxes increase on the wealthiest earners could help supplement a lot of the, the programs that we have, um, especially education. It's a huge problem, and sadly it won't be solved in one year or one term by the legislature. But there are some uh, steps we can take that I believe will be meaningful. We need to direct the resources of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board entirely to housing um, for the next several years. For those who may not know, it focuses on conservation and housing. Conservation is hugely important, but in that we have a crisis right now. Focus those dollars for housing. Some of the things we can do, um, some of uh, our viewership may be aware, with a, aware of a park in High Park, Sterling Area um, Park, that's a beautiful park for those over age 55. I think Vermont should target more quality mobile home parks which are affordable for older Vermonters, thereby when they sell their homes to move into the park, those homes will then become available for other Vermonters to buy. Yes, it may take some subsidies to help Vermonters with the affordability issue. Land, labor, and materials are the three primary components. We have a lot of land that has been acquired by the state through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. We should target that land and try to develop that for housing wherever we can. Vermont's made a strong effort to try to um, infill around our villages where the infrastructure is there for water and septic, et cetera. And that, that I think is very smart, but we may have to move that into other areas that are affordable in order to address excuse me, the affordability issue, which is critical. There's a number of things we can do.
Yeah, so we need to look at, um, and, and this did happen with the update to Act 250 in the last session. I think that the more could happen in terms of um, zoning laws and um, helping multi-unit um, buildings be built in town centers, village centers, um, giving more assistance to those projects and um, and really incentivizing the development of low income and um, affordable housing. And uh, we could also, you know, we, we have a couple different challenges. I sit on the Ag and Ecosystem um, Climate Council subcommittee, I'm the co-chair, and we are tasked with trying to find nature-based solutions to address the climate crisis. But, you know, and a lot of that is about preserving our nature and preserving um, land to sequester carbon, but then we have this other issue of providing enough housing. So I see a lot of development, commercial development happening. I see the development of these um, second home lots um, that are taking, you know, clearing woods and things, but then not enough development for low income housing. So looking at how development happens, and it can't be a siloed approach. It needs to be really um, thorough planning and really looking at every area in town. And it also requires a lot of input from town members and involvement. And um, any development project um, needs to have in community buy-in. Um, and in terms of homelessness, we need to stop, we, especially with the Supreme Court ruling, we can't criminalize homelessness. Homelessness happens to for so many different people for so many different reasons. And, um, you know, we can't say just because you're down in, on your luck, you're a criminal. And so Vermont really needs to put in place protections for homeless people and um, find ways to to get them in permanent housing. That's really the only way to address it. And a lot of these people have mental health issues or other health issues that they need, um, they need housing to address. Initially, I think, and primarily, we need to look at the cause of homelessness. For many, it moves into our drug uh, challenges. I don't know if that's an upcoming question, so I won't go deep there. But if we attack the causes instead of just the symptoms, we might be able to help people with the resilience so that they can be successful when they are housed. Making housing available for many Vermonters without the supports to address their challenges, challenges of poverty, challenges of health care, a number of different challenges, whether it's drug abuse or not. Without that, um, we're not getting any, the real value we need on the housing front. I believe Vermont would be wise to target, where appropriate, hotels or motels in the state that are marginally successful. Purchase those homes, those businesses, convert them to supported housing. Supported housing, I think, is the key. It's more than just three hots and a cot, it's, it, it, which is important for someone, critically important. Without, without the necessary supports, however, it'll be exceedingly hard for Vermonters to move to the next step. And that, to me, is critical. Housing without supports is not a therapeutic dose. We have to provide the supports for people to overcome the challenges that they face in order to be successful.
Yeah, so again, addressing the homeless, po um, homeless issue is going to help our communities and um, to address that issue, we need to provide housing. Um, you can't address homelessness without having housing, and a lot of homeless people don't want to live in shelters, and um, f and so they prefer to be on the streets than in shelters, and. So looking at the way that we create these programs and fund these programs and, you know, small houses um, or buying a hotel and then putting the homeless in that hotel, like the state owning the hotel, rather than, or working with partners to purchase the hotel um, to house homeless people until they can get on their feet and, and find a job and permanent housing. So the state needs to step in and really assist with this issue. And it's going to take the involvement of all partners, um, not just the state, but nonprofits, community members. Um, and we also have to look at, uh, you know, combine that with job training and, um, you know, a lot and also mental health. Um, assistance and um, care and a lot of these um, people are struggling with addiction and mental health issues and so we need to put more funding into those programs to also address the homeless issue I think we're going to have to look at other resources it's not my intent to knock on doors and to run for the legislature and to go through this process to increase the taxes of ordinary Vermonters but I would look at a wealth tax. I understand the, the fear of that, that it will drive the affluent out of Vermont. I don't think a, a lot of the affluent will be excited to leave their grandkids because there's a, a, a modest increase in their taxes. But there, there are some 3,200 tax filers with $4.6 billion of income in Vermont. That's according to the Public Assets Institute one of their most recent reports. I think a share of that could go towards making sure Vermont has the infrastructure and relieve the burden of what we currently use, property taxes, to maintain that infrastructure. If our roads are crumbling, if our water lines are falling apart, and, and that costs, and we think because of affordability, we won't increase taxes. That goes on to the burden of local taxpayers through the property tax. If we can find more broad-based taxes, such as a wealth tax, perhaps it won't address the entire problem, but it would go a long ways towards helping building and maintaining the infrastructure we need for the future, and at the same time helping us shift for a green, clean economy.
we definitely need to reduce our emissions, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, you know, putting more effort into creating public transportation systems, um, but also building out the EV charging infrastructure, that's not really in place yet. And th so those people that do have EVs have a way to charge at home. They, um, they tend to be a little wealthier. So um, we need to make it more accessible to everyone and you know for renters for people who live in apartment buildings you know who rely on street parking there needs to be a way for all those people to charge their cars if um we want people to move to electric and uh we need to provide you know for those people that can't afford to move to electric we need to provide pre a public transportation and really invest in that infrastructure in terms of resiliency um, for flooding, we need to look at our, our flood plains. And if those flood plains have been developed, look at removing that development and expanding those flood plains, especially upstream. Also looking at ways where we can um, improve soil health in areas so that there's more of a soil sponge and um, that water is um, infiltrating into the soil more instead of running off. Um, you know, look at where our paved infrastructure is impacting the runoff. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we can do. Also, our forest health, improving forest health can help with the amount of water that runs off our hillsides. Um, so uh, really investing in, in forest management and, and forest health. Uh, and then... Um, you know, in terms of green energy, really involving the community and looking at um, community investment in um, community solar projects. I do not believe it is the function of government to tell a woman what to do with her body. That's between her and her medical team and her spiritual team, if she has one. It's not the business of government to tell women what to do. Each choice is so highly personalized. I believe through the supports of organizations like Planned Parenthood and even our family centers and our local health care providers, we can help women make the necessary decisions that they need and have the proper health care that they need. But I'm... I'm uh, hesitant and more than hesitant I've never supported anything that would infringe upon the right of women to make that decision.
Yes, so um, I, I support a woman's right to choose, and I believe, you know, government is there to provide guardrails and to, to protect the population from um, unfor for unforeseen um, hardships, but its role is not, should not be in um, telling a woman what she can or cannot do with her body. And that's really left up to the individual to decide and the family to decide. Um, and I think that Vermont took a great step in, in codifying that right in the Constitution. Um, I think creating a fund so that we can assist more women who are in states that might not be able to um, get an abortion where they live to come here and then to um, you know make contraceptives available to uh, um, to anyone who needs them and uh, to continue to speak out about this um, to support um, sex, sex education in school that is based on science and um, and you know to just continue to inform our, our population on these issues. Well, I, I think the issue there are many issues, so many key issues. But I think the issue of health care needs to be put on the table. Health insurance premiums in Vermont are some of the highest in the nation. The Platinum Plan, the very best health care plan on Vermont Health Connect is in excess of $40,000 a year. That's almost double what it was five to six years ago. We need to find a sustainable way to make sure that health care is affordable in Vermont. Medicare and Medicaid pay 80% of our hospital bills today. And, and many people know that Medicare and Medicaid do not pay the full cost. When, it, when they do not pay the full cost, the balance is cost shifted to commercial insurance. The burden of commercial private insurance is crushing to Vermonters who, and businesses who try to uh, sustain that cost by themselves. There's many things we can do, but we need to move more aggressively away from what we call fee for service or we pay for each item um, uh, portion of payments to one that rewards the healthcare system for keeping us healthy. And we also need to, to be a part of that to keep our own uh, selves healthy. We have an acute crisis in Vermont of a uh, shortage of nurses. The report indicated we need some 5,000 nurses. Vermont needs to lead the nation and say, if you come to Vermont, we will pay for your nursing college education if you agree to stay in Vermont for a certain period of time. We couldn't, we would set a budget, we couldn't do it for all nurses at the same time, but that type of, those type, excuse me, of investments are critical going forward.
Uh, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm really invested in the agricultural economy, and I think that there's a lot more the state can do to help our farmers um, and incent incentivize our farmers to farm in a way that is going to help our climate um, issues and um, offer them the support to change their farming practices, um, the financial support, and, you know, Things like paying them to uh, go through the process of writing a conservation action plan on their farm, um, paying them for um, practices that are going to help um, run out with runoff and erosion. And there's there's USDA programs, but I feel like the state could do even more to assist our farmers and to also increase the markets for locally produced food. Um, and so I really want to work on helping the farmers and the agricultural economy.